as we turn our attention to the Lord and his word together this morning. Would you please join with me in prayer? Lord God, we are so grateful for who you are and the fact that given who you are, that you are mindful of us. Lord, you're more than mindful. You have loved us even when we rebelled against you. You were willing to sacrifice even your son so that we might be redeemed even after rebelling against you. Not only that, Lord, but you have through that given us the ability to be forgiven of all of our sin, all of our trespass, all of our guilt in regards to our rebellion against you. You've adopted us as your sons and your daughters. You've moved us from death to life. You give us hope, not just for this life, but for eternity. Lord, you lavish blessings on us that we do not deserve. But Lord, we thank you that you give them according to your grace and your love, which surpasses even our human ability to understand. Lord, this season that we've entered into has given us an opportunity as a church to reflect on things that you have done in time and space in human history to solve the problem that we caused and we couldn't fix for ourselves, and this you do out of love for us. We thank you for this time to pause as a church and to reflect on Jesus. We thank you that we have the opportunity to reflect on his willingness to go to the cross, to pay the price, to take the consequence that we were due because of our sin. And we thank you that next Sunday we get to come in here celebrating because Jesus' death was not the end of the story. But in fact, Lord, you, rose, you raised him from the dead in the same way that we too will one day be raised to new life. And so, Lord, we thank you for this, and we thank you for the hope that it promises. And we thank you that we get to celebrate this in this place with our brothers and sisters. And Lord, we pray even now for those who might come next week especially, who don't know you, who are far from you, or who have walked away from you at some point in their lives. And we pray, Lord, even now that you would prepare their hearts, prepare their minds to hear the gospel and to respond positively to it. We thank you, Lord, that if we were talking about our own human efforts, then we could have a lot of doubt about what was going to take place next week. But we thank you, Lord, that because our hope is in you and you are the God who works, that we can expect great things. So, Lord, please be with us today and open our hearts and minds as we study your word together, as we learn together, grow together, and as together we seek you to transform us more and more into the image of Christ as we engage with you through the study of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, happy Palm Sunday. Uh, if you didn't recognize that it was Palm Sunday, I ask that you pay a little closer attention uh, to the many facets that are uh, around our church. And again, I want to thank uh, Jay Congleton for providing the palms, for uh, Darlene Kirchman for uh, decorating for hours yesterday to get the church ready. Uh, thank you to Matt Sweet, who's the only reason why we have anything on this screen here. If you were here last week, you know we have had technical difficulties. And Shirley Vickery's not here with us today, uh, but she coordinated the cleaning of the carpets. And so we are ready to enter into this season together. And thank you to all those who worked hard uh, to make sure that we have the opportunity to do that together as a church. We are celebrating today Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday, if, as you read about it, and we will in just a few moments, it celebrates the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And yet, if we are aware of the story, if we're aware of the historical events that we read about in Scripture, even as we reflect on that moment, there are things that should pop into our head. For instance, the many times before Jesus' triumphal entry that he predicted that when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be rejected and he's going to suffer and he's going to die. Or the fact that we know these events are going to take place. In fact, this whole week, Jesus' Passion Week, is where we reflect on those things that are done. And so even when we look at this tremendous event of Jesus' welcome into Jerusalem, his triumphal entry, there is still those other things in our mind as we know the story of what's about to take place uh, as he goes throughout the week. 
But let's begin by reading this passage together. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Matthew chapter 21, and we are going to read the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, what we celebrate at Palm Sunday. Again, that's Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to start in verse 1. And for those of you who do not have a Bible with you or in front of you, um, again, you can thank Matt Sweet after the service. It will be up on the screen today. So Matthew 21, starting in verse 1, and here is what it says. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so again, we see here what we celebrate on Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry. For a while now, uh, in the narratives of the Gospels, we see Jesus doing all the things that Jesus is known to have done, the healings, the teachings, all these kinds of things, as he is moving toward Jerusalem, where he will meet his ultimate purpose in even coming to the earth. And you know, we could read this passage again and just be so excited. Hey, look, everything is going really well. In fact, for Jesus' followers, we, we see in the, in the parallel accounts that that is exactly what they thought. Look how great it is. Praise God. Things are going well. And yet things, as you know, change. But let's take a look at just some of the things that we see reflected here in this passage. Uh, we see, first of all, this shouting of Hosanna. Hosanna means save. And so they're calling out to Jesus to intervene. They're calling out to Jesus to save. And in just a few minutes, we're going to see what it is that they particularly were looking forward to Jesus saving them from. But it is tied to this other thing that we see that they are proclaiming as Jesus is coming, son of David. And who is this son of David? And why were they expecting him? And why did they uh, associate Jesus with this son of David? Now we know from the beginning of Luke's gospel, this prediction from the angel when Jesus is being born, that he is a descendant of David, and he will be the one to take David's throne. And this was the expectation. That Jesus was in fact the Messiah who would come and establish his reign in Jerusalem over all of Israel and all of these good things that they have been promised in the scriptures and repeated by their parents and and held on to in dark times. They were expecting the fulfillment of this to come in Jesus. And as he came in just the same way that Zechariah prophesied on a donkey, they got excited. Perhaps this is the moment. Perhaps this is the man Perhaps all the things we have longed for are about to happen in our day, in our midst. And yet we know what happens just a few days later, and I think it's important that we turn there and take a look at that as well. Turn with me just a few chapters later, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, we're going to start reading in verse 20. This is Jesus after his arrest, after he stood before the high priest and the Sanhedrin, the rulers of the Jewish people, and they condemned him. 
And after he had been turned over by them to the Romans, to Pilate, who is the governor over Judea, appointed by the Roman Empire uh, to be at that station. And here Jesus is before, uh, on trial, if you will, before Pilate. And there's crowds of people, lots of people gathered all around, including those who were his accusers. And here's what we see starting in verse 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with this Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is, it is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. This has to beg the question, because we're not talking about a long period of time. We're talking about days. In fact, if we look at our, our Holy Week, Passion Week, if we consider the events that happen between Palm Sunday and Easter, today is, uh, today is Sunday, and by Friday, he's being crucified. Thursday night, he's being arrested. What happened in such a short time that five days later, all the crowds are screaming, crucify him. And you have to just imagine that at least a good amount of them were among those who either were shouting, chanting, excited about his arrival at Jerusalem, or at least were just amazed about what was playing out before them as Jesus was entering and all of these crowds were praising him and looking forward with eager anticipation to great things. Why turn on him now? And so I want to talk to you a little bit about what happened. What was it that they expected that perhaps didn't go the way they expected it? And why is it that they would have even expected these particular things of this son of David, of this Messiah who would come? And how did Jesus not meet that expectation when he arrived? And so I want to look at just a couple things together. And the first thing is this, that they weren't looking to for a savior at least in terms of a spiritual savior. They weren't looking for somebody to come and die on a cross for their sins. They weren't looking for the things that we typically think of or associate Jesus with. They were looking for, as was promised in their scriptures, a king, a human king, a descendant of King David, the king who God promised, your dynasty will endure forever. One will come in your line and reign over your kingdom from your throne forever and ever and ever. And remember that for hundreds of years at this point, that line of David seemed to be broken. And yet promises of God were that it would one day be restored. This is a people group who saw the end of the Davidic monarchy when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem and carted their people off into exile, as they saw the temple of God lying in ruins along with the rest of their city of Jerusalem. People who, even when they returned back, never had another king in the line of David, who had constant oppression and conflicts with all of these foreign nations. And even now, as Jesus is coming, here is the Roman occupation, the Roman Empire, this oppressive people who everywhere you looked, there was signs of their kingdom encroaching upon Israel. And as they saw Jesus coming, perhaps now, perhaps in him, God will restore the kingdom and put David's son on the throne. A lot of them expected that Jesus would in fact overthrow the Romans and establish a Jewish state in fact, in their history, in recent times, there have been those who God used to rise up and to lead a revolt against an oppressive nation that had set themselves up in Israel, and they had been victorious. 
And in Jesus' day, they celebrated these heroes of old, these ones who for a time were able to achieve miraculous victory. And as they saw Jesus and hoped that he was the Messiah, they had no less an expectation that he would, as king, overthrow the Romans, expelling them from their land, and setting up once again a sovereign, independent Jewish state. There were prophecies throughout Scripture that at that time when the Messiah comes, God would finally put an end to any remnants of this exile. That God would take not just the Jews who were in Israel, but would gather all of their people who've been scattered for hundreds of years throughout the empires that have risen and fallen and would gather them all back to this place. And this king would reign with peace and prosperity and all the pains and the sorrows of the past would be done away with. And when Jesus came and they were saying, save, Hosanna, son of David, this was their expectation. So why? Why was this what was expected? Why is this what they saw in Jesus as he came on Palm Sunday at his triumphal entry into Jerusalem? Well, first of all, because this is the promise of scripture. They didn't miss the fact that The Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament talks over and over and over again that this Messiah would reign, that he would destroy his enemies, that he would establish his kingdom on the earth. He would rule on David's throne. It'd be a time of peace. In fact, the lion would lay down with the lamb. People would give up their swords and their shields and their weapons of war because there would be no longer any need for them. So I don't think they were off base. In fact, they were clinging tightly to what God had revealed over and over again through his word, that God would raise up a king to do just this. In fact, the passage that is often referred to on Palm Sunday, the prophecy from the Old Testament from Zechariah 9.9, that he would come on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, comes right from this Zechariah 9 passage, which refers to the king coming and setting up his kingdom at the end times. And so this was the expectation biblically for these people. It was also the theology of the day. In fact, as hundreds of years of this impression had come, as conflict had come, as as there's been no peace, they desperately longed for this time. And so this is what was talked about. This is what was written about, this eye on the future, this longing for the end time when God would visit the earth and the Messiah would rise and he would establish his kingdom because they were so weary and tired of so many years of war. And so this was the theology of the day. This was the thing that they focused in on more than most because of how important that promise was when that Messiah would do those things. And again, as I mentioned, we have a recent history at this point. Within within 175 years of the events that we're reading about in Jesus's day, there was a group of people that God raised up to fight against a Greek king, to overthrow a powerful force that was more powerful than they were, but God delivered them and established through this family, through these heroes of old, peace in the land. And so certainly they thought God can do that again. Who better to do that through than the Messiah? In fact, we have evidence that this is their expectation. In fact, even the disciples, Jesus' followers, you'd think they would get it. And yet, what do we see? I want to read you a verse in just a moment, but let me set it up for you just momentarily. Jesus goes to the cross. He's dead. Within three days, he's risen again from the dead. He appears to them over a period of 40 days, teaching them about the kingdom of God, giving them good instruction about what they can expect. And even so, right before he ascends to heaven to sit down at the right hand of the Father, here's what's asked by his closest followers. This is from Acts 1.6. It says, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So even after Jesus died to atone for sins, even after God raised him from the dead, even after he spent then a prolonged period of time teaching them more and more and more about the kingdom of God, more than we've even seen in the three years he's ministered to them, and they still were expecting the Messiah to do this now. So what about this crowd? 
this crowd shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, praising God, laying down their cloaks, laying down palm branches on the ground before him, recognizing him as king as he enters. Why do they turn on him? Because they didn't expect him to come and be subject to the Romans. He didn't expect them. They didn't expect him to be uh, condemned by the religious leaders. They expected an uprising. They expected a fight for their people. What do we see? Chapter 27 of Matthew, verses 20 through 23. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. I want to read that verse again. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. And then, consequently, verse 21, which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Jesus was rejected by the leaders of the people. I'd like to believe in our church that you put at least some stake, some, some trust in your elders, in your governing board, in your pastor. Um, we don't have ultimate authority. We're human. We make mistakes. But there's something to be said for those leaders over you. And certainly in Jesus' day, this was exactly the same case when it comes to the leaders of the Jewish people. These were the elders of the people. These were the religious leaders. These were the ones who interpreted the laws. These are the ones who uh, took charge of the spiritual life of the people. These are the ones who were mediators, if you will, between God and the people of Israel. There was a huge amount of trust and respect for their decisions. And certainly, if Jesus was coming and he was the Messiah, wouldn't their own leaders have received him? And so when the chief priests, when the leaders, the elders among the people are saying, we're going to shout to crucify him, they thought certainly we were wrong. This was not the one. Also, Jesus, who they expected to come and to deliver them from the hands of the Roman Empire to establish Jewish autonomy, Jewish independence, a Jewish kingdom, yet again, just as the scripture had promised, he didn't come opposing the Romans. He stands now condemned before them at their mercy, facing trial under a Roman procurator. And who, and it's interesting, it's so telling, it didn't dawn on me till yesterday. How many times, raise your hand if you've ever read the Bible, the same passage you've read a hundred times and you got something you didn't get before. Raise your hand if you've had that moment. Okay, good. I had that yesterday. I love that. So don't think your pastor knows everything. I certainly don't. I'm sure nobody thinks that. But uh, I love those moments, those epiphanies, those moments where it's like, I never saw that before. Here's what I found interesting. How amazing it is. Again, this is what they were looking for. Jesus, they realized, was not going to fit the bill. Who did they ask to release instead? A zealot, an insurrectionist, one who's guilty of murder. What murder? Probably a murder of a Roman in their fight to, rise, to raise people up in response to this Roman occupation. Barabbas. Jesus is not going to be our zealot, our, our, our clarion call. He's not going to be our fighter. He's not going to be the king who destroys his enemies and gets rid of the Roman Empire. But Barabbas will continue to fight with us. Release Barabbas to us. How, uh, how fitting it is for this moment as they missed what God was doing through Jesus and instead looked to this man, Barabbas, who would continue to do what they had hoped the Messiah would do. We know what Jesus' understanding of these events were. For Jesus, nothing was off course. For the people, everything was off course. We had hoped that he'd do this. We had hoped that he'd do that. But for Jesus, there was no doubt. Jesus was going exactly where he knew he would. 
If you were with us last week, we took a look at Jesus' Last Supper. And I want to remind you of these words from Matthew chapter 26. As Jesus, here in the middle of a Passover Seder, is drawing a line of connection between the very first Passover, where God, by his grace, provided a substitute, a lamb, whose blood would be put on the doorpost so that they would not be judged because of their sin and death would pass over them. And Jesus, looking forward to the death that he would die where his blood would cover so that just judgment would again pass over. Here's what he says, Matthew 26, 27 through 28. The text says, Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so as Jesus takes this third cup of the Passover meal, the one that's after supper, the one that's referred to as the cup of redemption, the one that is tied to that lamb that was slain as a substitute, as a sacrifice, so that sin might be covered over by God's grace, Jesus takes that cup and says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of many. Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus knew what was happening. In fact, before any of this took place, we saw him even in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, just crying out his heart to the Father. If there's any other way, but not my will, but your will. Literally sweating blood because he was so anxious about what he knew was about to transpire and yet steadfast in his conviction that this had to happen and that he was going to be obedient to the Father. Jesus knew what he was doing. Everyone else's perception of his death was very different. Jesus' perception of his death was that it paid the price. It did the job to reconcile lost people to the holy God, that sins might be covered and people wouldn't receive the judgment. But here's what everybody else saw. Here's what the crowds who shouted, crucify him, saw. Here's what everybody who didn't understand what Jesus was saying saw that Jesus was cursed by God. Here's this from Deuteronomy chapter 21, 22 through 23. Before I read this, let me say this. Of all the books of the Hebrew Bible, of the Old Testament, the first five books are the most important. The first five books are the books of the law, the books of Moses. And these are held even higher than all the others of the Jewish scriptures. And in this book of the law, here's what it says. Uh, Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23. It says, If someone guilty of a capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it that same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. Now you might be thinking, well, he died on a cross, not on a pole. This is how this passage was interpreted by Jewish people of this time period in regards to those who died by crucifixion. We see this over and over again. This wasn't the view of a few. This was the view of all. And so if a Jewish person, if any person had died by crucifixion, they saw that person not just as having been condemned by the Romans, but that God himself has cursed that person. They don't stand for God. God has brought judgment against them in their condemnation. And so this crowd that sees Jesus, that he goes to, if they had any doubt before, maybe he was the Messiah, maybe he wasn't the Messiah. As soon as he went to the cross, it solidified it in his mind. In fact, we know this is true because we see even Paul having to contend with this as he is ministering in Jesus's name. We see this became a facet of Paul's ministry as he continued to minister to Jewish people about Jesus. He had to explain from the scriptures showing that the Messiah had to die in this way. We see it in Acts 17, 1 through 4. uh, uh, It says this, When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. 
Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. And here's one that's even more specific, that hits the nail on the head in terms of how those who stood apart would have understood Jesus. This is Galatians 3.13. Paul's writing, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. And so Paul very eloquently and succinctly puts it like this, that we were under God's curse because of our sin. The law has made that clear because we can't keep it. And Jesus was made a curse for us so that we might have salvation. And so we know that Jesus knew where he was dying for, but for the others, it was hard for them to imagine that he was the Messiah. Even the disciples had some doubts. He'd, they expected him to come and set up his kingdom right now, as we saw in Acts 1.6. Is now the time? They couldn't wait for that day, just like the rest of their Jewish brothers and sisters. And what did they do when Jesus was arrested and Jesus was condemned? The disciples ran and the disciples hid. And they thought that they had been mistaken about Jesus. In fact, he got downgraded in their mind. How many times did we see these little moments? Who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. We see this affirmation a couple times before Jerusalem. And what happens after his death? We read this account after Jesus' resurrection as he's appearing to some of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, and we see this little window into their understanding of those events that just transpired. This is from Luke 24, verses 19 through 21. It says, About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. This is Jesus' followers, the ones who believed he was the Messiah, and now they refer to him as a prophet. Those who say we had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. And in just a few verses later, Jesus reveals to them, um, you realize who you're talking to here? And he shows them through the scriptures that this is exactly what had to happen for their salvation. And what a beautiful picture. Jesus was never under God's curse, not before anything that he did. He certainly wasn't rejected by God. How do we know that? Because his moment of vindication was his resurrection from the dead, which we get to celebrate next week. You know, there are, here's the thing about miracles. There's miracles and then there's other things but a miracle is something only God can accomplish. Now, sometimes he enacts those through his people. But believe me, they're not the power behind the miracle. God is the power behind the miracle. Only God has the power to do a miracle. And there are things done that claim to be miracles. There are tricks. There are probably things evil spirits do that could give the appearance of a miracle. But there's some things that nobody could do by, but God, things that are clearly a miracle, and there's no contesting that. And I would argue that someone who is dead for three days, rising to new life, qualifies as a bona fide miracle. Would you agree with me? And only God can perform a miracle. And so God raised Jesus from the dead. And if you've been in this church, if you've known me long enough, you've heard mountains of evidence for that fact. By God's grace, he has been given us historical evidence to be able to demonstrate the truth of it. Come back next week, you'll hear some of it. God raised Jesus from the dead. But here's the thing. During his life, before his death, Jesus made a whole lot of claims a whole lot of claims about himself, a whole lot of claims about his relationship with God the Father. And by raising Jesus from the dead, God not only vindicated Jesus, but confirmed every last thing Jesus did and said. God would not raise a liar 
from the dead. God would not raise a blasphemer from the dead. God would not validate someone who spoke wrong things about him, but God raised Jesus from the dead. And by raising Jesus from the dead, he validated every claim that Jesus made. What a wonderful God we serve. And you know what? We could take joy in the triumphal entry of Jesus because while all the crowds around may have had their hopes dashed to pieces as soon as their religious leaders denounced him and he stood condemned before the Romans, we know that he entered Jerusalem for the very purpose which he fulfilled on the cross. That our sin might be paid for. That we might be, those who have been apart from God because of our sin, might be reconciled to our God. That we, who have been dead, walking around as dead people, spiritually cut off from the source of life, can have new life, eternal life, now and forever. That we, who lived in a world without hope, now have hope, now and forever. That no matter what we face, no matter what hardships come our way, no matter what calamity we see as we look out the doors, we know we have hope because God is unmovable and God is sovereign and his will will out. Praise God. This is a wonderful week for us. The truths that we celebrate this week are not only true this week, by the way. In fact, it needs to be Resurrection Sunday in our hearts every day. It needs to be Good Friday every day. It needs to be Palm Sunday every day because these truths are always true. And yet I praise God that uh, those who've gone before us thought enough to put it on the church calendar uh, that we can, together with the body of Christ all around the world, reflect on these things at this time of year because if we're being completely honest, we get busy we don't have our priorities in order. We don't read the Bible as much as we should. We let a lot of things guide us. We need to provide for our family. We, we, we have a, a demanding job. Uh, you know, hey, it's season. I'm working morning till night. Uh, uh, you know, I have expectations that my community expects of me. And, and we have a lot of things vying for our time. We have a lot of distractions that happen in life. We face hardships and they derail us from our plans. We, we, we tune into the news and see the chaos around the whole world today, and we start, to, we, we start to get down about things in the world, and there are so many other things that distract our hearts, that distract our minds from the very truths that are essential for us, that God loved us so much that he was willing to send his own son, that Jesus went willingly to the cross to atone for our sins, that God raised him from the dead to secure our right standing before him, and that we might know the truth of these things that have been done for us. And friends, I could tell you till I'm blue in the face, you need to read your Bible. You need to go evangelize. You need to come to church. You need to serve the Lord and you know, find out your gifts and use them. And I could tell you all the things you're supposed to do. But here's the thing. Do you know what, what for me at least in my life, transitioned me from... These are the things I have to do to, I can't wait to do these things. It's by keeping these truths, these historical events that, that, that are of infinite significance to us, by keeping them near and dear to your heart, to reflecting on them every single day. The gospel is not just to be proclaimed out there, but to be reminded of every single day. And as you remember what God has done for you, what choice do you have? but to live your life in response to it, to worship God with your very life because of how much he loved you and what he was willing to do for you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that despite our rebellion, despite our selfishness, despite our foolishness, Despite our wrong priorities, despite every way we get it wrong, you have loved us anyway. And we thank you for your willingness to send your son, knowing full well the sins that we've done in the past, the sins that we do now, and the sins that we don't even know we're going to do. 
And yet you still chose us. You chose to redeem us. You want to be with us now and forevermore. What a great promise by a God of love and grace that we can't even fully understand. Lord, this is a special week. Don't let us miss it. Help us, Lord, to take time each and every day to pray, to read the scriptures, to remind ourselves of the gospel, to remember who it is we serve and why we serve him. Now, Lord, do not let us pass this week by without telling someone else, many other people, about what you have done for us, what you have done for them. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.